Leftover, Season 3, Episode 4. Good day, Melbourne. <laughs> One of my favorite episodes of my favorite shows. Now, like many other episodes, it's packed with symbolism, foreshadowing, and callbacks to prior episodes. But what made this episode so special was that final scene. Now, I'm not even sure how I feel right now. I just know that I love the show and I'm going to miss it when it's done. I've got four more weeks to go. Okay, in this video, I'm going to go over 40 top moments in Easter eggs from Season 3, Episode 4. And as always, major credit to my friends over on the Leftover subreddit who noticed a bunch of cool stuff related to Kevin and Nora's fragmenting relationship, babies, cancer, the concept of escape, fire, and references to an explosion. So without further ado, here we go. Number one. I'll just see you on the other side, okay? Apparently, Nora was wearing a wireless bra, which is why she didn't get stopped under the detector. Number three. The dude who was stopped by TSA mentions a nuclear bomb. The explosion. It's illegal to transfer over 20,000 cash across country borders without declaring it, but Kev had a pretty good question. Why don't you just give me half? Kev and Nora start this episode really close, making love, and they ended apart with what White Al Roker 1 calls, quote, the greatest TV breakup ever, and I'm not going to disagree. That scene was pretty sick. Number six, we hear a baby crying on the plane. Then Nora says, We're better off apart than together. We see a fire hydrant sign on the wall, which is a foreshadowing to the fire in the final scene, and I stumbled onto this next one accidentally. Check out the mirror imagery, which suggests that you can be alone, even in the presence of others. Now, this shot of Nora on a phone with Kevin, blurry in the background, reminds me of a similar shot that we see later on with Lori on the phone and John blurry in the background. And Nora and John both express a little bit of insecurity or jealousy towards their partners, Kevin and Lori, respectively. Are you going to follow me, Kevin? I have to do this alone, okay? Kevin can't turn off the show, which is symbolic of the madness that continues to surround them despite their attempts to escape it. And the cups in this painting remind me of the cups that we see later on. Three small ones and a big one. When Kevin calls to have the front desk turn off the TV, they call him Mr. Durst. Just be a moment, Mr. Durst. Uh, it's uh, uh, Mr. Garvey. Which is the only reason that Kevin Sr. was able to find him at the end of the episode. He called the local hotels. Here you goddamn are. Hey there. Son, that's Grace. In this episode, we got a lot of opera music. And I know they're in Melbourne, but the country as a whole is known for opera via the Sydney Opera House. I like opera a little bit, so that was pretty cool. And check out the harmonies in this song, which stand in stark contrast to what we see amongst the characters we love who are not in harmony at all right now. Sura 81. Let me know in the comments section if any of you has any idea what that means. Number 19. This is a shot of Kevin leaning in close to a TV, and it reminds me of a shot from the International Assassin episode of season two. And the light on the TV goes out on Kevin, just like the light of the room goes out on Nora at the end of the episode. In this scene, we hear the song, Take On Me, Take On <laughs> for the first time, which as Redditor LucasRD11 points out, grows throughout the episode. The first time we hear it, it's a practice version on the piano. Then we hear a pretty cool cover song done by a brass band. And then the third time we hear it, it's the original version at the end of the show as we watch that final badass scene of the episode. But we're jumping ahead. Let's get back to Nora. Nora meets Dr. Aiden and Dr. Becker, which are the first two letters of the alphabet, A and B. I don't know if there's anything to that. Maybe it has to do with experimentation, something science-y, alpha and beta. The alpha seemed to be pro-device, whereas the beta had her doubts. So this is a stretch, but I figured I'd throw it out there for you guys since you're all pretty smart. Maybe you can make something of it. We then meet this dude. His name's Bernard, and of course my mind starts racing in regards to Westworld. I'm not going to spoil anything there for you, but go watch that show if you haven't already. It's freaking awesome. And is it just me, or does Bernard look like the guy that pushes the button in the trailers? Maybe we'll see him in episode 5, and maybe the button is related to the explosion that we hear about. I hope not, though, because that might mean that Matt would die in a nuclear explosion, and that would not be a good day. The next scene shows Lori and John working their scam, but the audio, if you listen to it, it definitely applies to Nora and Kevin as well, and maybe even Matt and Mary. Give him a hug and tell him the dead wife wants him to move on. Wait a second. Is this symbolic of Lori wanting Kevin to move on from his craziness? And if so, is Lori already dead? Are they all dead? <laughs> I'm pretty confused, not gonna lie. And since we mentioned John, I just want to throw a shout out to the actor Kevin Carroll, who plays John Murphy in the show. We all constantly speak about the legendary performances of Coon and Thoreau. They're both awesome, but let's be honest, the entire cast is really, really good. 
In season two, John struck me as this badass. He's constantly on edge trying to maintain control and ultimately losing it. Yet in season three, this dude grows a beard, which I need to shave, and more importantly, he changes his behaviors. He becomes so warm and huggable, for lack of better words. Well done, Kevin Carroll. You got a fan of me? I'm excited to follow you and your acting career. Number 26. Lori's still smoking, even though she's long gone from the guilty remnant. Now, here's a cool one. According to Justin Thoreau's Instagram, one of the executive producers, Damon Lindelof, may have been in a cameo underneath this giant koala costume. That's pretty cool. Back to the show. We learned that Nora is using an IUD device. It's a form of birth control. I had to look that one up. But as far as I know, it's not perfect protection. Like many others, I think she's pregnant, maybe with twins. In this next scene, we get the second version of Take On Me. This time it's performed by a breast section. And side note, this reminded me of the awesome musical score at the end of episode one, which was also performed by a brass ensemble, brass section, whatever you want to call it. In the library, Kevin makes up a title of a book called Assassins. <laughs> Kevin's so funny. If you're like me, I connected this to his alter ego from the International Assassin episode. But Redditor rmarty78 pointed out something way cooler. There's an actual book called Assassins from a series called Left Behind, which is about a rapture and might even involve Australia. Well done, R. Marty. Well done. I have started a new life. You don't have the right to take that away from me. I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand what's happening. And I'm with Redditor Sedevson. I say these words after pretty much every single episode. <laughs> Alpha and Beta then asked Nora the same question that the burning dude from episode 3 asked to Kevin Sr. Would you kill a baby if it would cure cancer? But Nora says yes, whereas the burning dude said no. They didn't take me. Which begs the question, how come the physicist denied both of them? Is it possible that it's not how you answer, but how you react or what you do afterwards? Or possibly Nora has not been denied yet, they just made it seem that way? Where's Bernard? Did he bounce already? Kevin and Nora fight and the alarm goes off. Yet Kevin and Nora ignore it. Figuratively speaking, they're ignoring a lot of red flags in their insanity instead of seeking help from friends, family, and specialists. And it's worth noting that this is the second time that he's had to leave a hotel because of a fire alarm. Kevin says something to Nora that made us go, whoa. They are just gone. Then you should go be with them. Just like Tom did in episode two, if I recall correctly. And accordingly, we see her sitting there weeping in tears and utter pain. It was heart wrenching. The sprinklers pour down on Nora, which foreshadows the flood that some are expecting to arrive on the seventh year anniversary of the departure. And a combination of the sprinklers and her own tears fly off of her face. This was like the Tom scene on steroids, which isn't surprising. Like Yo Philly says, Nora has probably had these tears stored up for years. And in this legendary closing scene, we hear the song Take On Me one last time. That's a third time. And this time, it's completed its progression to the original version which sounds kind of weird now that I say it, because it's sort of like you're progressing back to the original. Maybe it's symbolic of needing to find your way back home, so to say, like the characters all did in the finales of seasons one and two. Wow, what an episode, though. Episode, season three, episode four. Well done, guys. As a side note, I based a prior video on a theory from Redditor Lame of Thrones. <laughs> awesome name. Lame of Thrones was kind enough to respond back to me with a follow-up post. I'm going to throw a link to that video in the description of this one. If you have time, read that person's post. It touches on a lot of cool stuff related to Nora, Kevin, a child, and the future of season three. And even though Lame of Thrones wrote all this after episode two, pretty much all of it still applies, which is a testament to how well this Redditor understands the show. So that's it for this one. If anyone wants to be my first patron ever, don't be shy. <laughs> all it takes is a dollar a month to support the channel. All right, this is Kev. I'll talk to you guys.